Mystic Force is sadly another season that doesn't have a team-up. I imagine, like other seasons before it, it was a cost-saving measure, since team-up episodes require less Sentai footage and more original shots, even if they do use the Sentai team-ups. It probably would have been difficult to write around as well, since SBD takes place in the future and everything, but I do find it kind of sad that there wasn't one. SBD is very much entrenched in future technology, so it would be kind of neat to see two teams with very different sources for their powers playing off each other. The story continues in the two-parter The Gatekeeper. Mordecai kidnaps a balloon salesman who happens to be an oracle to find out a way to escape the underworld. The oracle says that the gatekeeper can allow him to return, but Mordecai is not pleased with this revelation. The gatekeeper is no more! Her life force was spent sealing the gate! Well then just get the key master then. It's your next best option. This is not difficult to figure out, Mordecai. Actually, it seems that there is another gatekeeper that has risen in their absence, but the Oracle can't identify them, only that there's someone close to the Power Rangers. Lily is there and suspects that it's Toby, but after a failed attempt to take him, the Oracle reveals that it wasn't him and he manages to escape. Udana explains to the Rangers about the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper was a powerful sorceress named Niela. She was my sister. Niela cast a spell that sealed the gate and banished Mordecai and his armies to the underworld. The spell was so strong that it depleted all of her life force. But her spirit lives on in my heart and through the legacy of her heir. She had a child? Yes. And I fear that is who Necroli is seeking. So we have to find the child first and protect them. You won't have to look far. Niela's daughter and the heir to the gatekeeper's power is Claire. Korag receives a power boost from their master, but Necroli begs for his help in finding the gatekeeper or else she's toast. Korag, realizing that their master would want to find the gatekeeper, bestows power upon her. Necroli's plan is basically to beat the crap out of the rangers until the gatekeeper appears, since someone so good and noble wouldn't allow that to happen. That is an extremely lame plan, since the rangers get screwed up all the time in difficult fights. Claire is upset about her legacy, thinking that she could never live up to it. You don't think I can handle it, because I'm incompetent and bumbling and clumsy. And I... Exactly as your mother was. You are so much like her. But I thought that she was a great sorceress. Oh, she was. But not at first. Korag, in the meantime, has a similar plan, though in his case, he kidnaps Udana, who isn't able to fight him off without her snow staff. With Udana kidnapped and the rangers on the ropes, Claire picks up her mother's magical artifacts and goes to intercept Necroli. With the artifacts, Claire is able to repel Necroli at first, but later Necroli channels her power to open the gate to the underworld. However, not before a pretty cool fight with Korag. I've gotta say, despite the poor use of explosions, it never fails to amaze me that Power Rangers actually manages to create much more exciting fight scenes than a lot of Hollywood movies, especially recent ones that prefer to have close-up shaky cam crap as opposed to letting us see the full bodies of the people fighting. This is some crouching tiger stuff right here. So yeah, the gate is summoned and Claire is taken by Korag, leaving the rangers to deal with the giant gargoyle of the gate. To make matters worse, Mordecai gets through the gate and makes short work of the rangers. The city is enveloped in darkness as the giant monsters start wreaking havoc, Korag even siphoning Claire's magic to open the gate entirely so their armies can get through. All in all, it's been a bit of a crappy day. Nick storms through the gate on his own and interrupts the energy draining, challenging Korag to single combat. After a very intense battle, which mostly consists of Nick getting tossed aside, pro tip, don't bring boxing gloves to a sword fight. Nick finally manages to defeat Korag and break his sword. Claire and Nick combine their magical power and gain control over Catastros. Well, not really, because in a future episode, suddenly he's back with Korag again. I, I don't get it either. And with the last of her mother's magical energy, the gate is lowered once more. Udana, meanwhile, manages to access her snow staff and gives the 
Rangers the power to destroy Mordecai. Before she can reclaim the staff entirely, though, Korag stops her and tells her she can leave, since she's fulfilled her purpose in being captured, but he's keeping the staff. With Mordecai gone, Korag takes his sword. Necroli unleashes an evil wizard called Imperius to take over now that Mordecai is gone, but fortunately the Rangers have a new ally, a cowardly cat genie named Genji. Genji is... Kind of more comic relief. Yes, just keep throwing comic relief characters at the show. Imperius, however, makes a much stronger impression, matching the Rangers' power beat for beat and even grows to Serpentera size to swat the Megazord, and it's only thanks to his own diminished power from being in a cave for several years that keeps him from finishing the job. The Dragon Egg also hatches into this CGI thing. The Rangers come across a man in the forest who Modana recognizes as Kalindor, an old warrior she had fought alongside. He claims that another friend of theirs, Daggeron, placed a curse on him, but both Genji and Phineas are afraid of Kalindor when they spot him. Phineas tells Claire that Kalindor actually betrayed Daggeron and the original Mystics. What's worse, it turns out he actually became Imperious. Daggeron, it turns out, has been sealed inside the body of a frog, who is freed when Madison kisses him. Daggeron has his own morphed form as the Solaris Knight, who kind of fills the sixth ranger role. Kalindor was seduced by the dark side of the force or something, but Udana is more concerned about her missing child, Bowen. Daggeron doesn't know what happened to him, unfortunately, but we do get an interesting little revelation at the end of the episode. Mystic Force are gonna find out what I did. Yes, they're gonna find out. Yo, what am I gonna do? And like Nick's little secret, this doesn't actually end up being that important, unfortunately. The Solaris Knight actually does get a proper Zord that he doesn't grow into. It's a magical train. A magical train that sucks in the monster like the trap from Ghostbusters and incinerates them in its engine. Okie dokie. We get Genji's backstory that he was once a great warrior of his village of cat people, but a jealous king cast a spell on the village that made everyone think he was evil and he got exiled. He opened up an evil trap box and Daggeron put him inside the lamp to save his life. This brings me to a problem the season has. Far too many peripheral characters. It's like the show just gets bored with the characters it introduces, then goes out of its way to make new ones instead of spending more time developing the ones it has. Oh, and speaking of comic relief peripheral characters... Wishes. Drop the appetizer, Calico. Oh. This is my buffet. Who are you? Piggy's the name. My. Rummaging's the game. I'm all alone. Oh. Sure, in another 20 years, this place will be crawling with aliens. But for now, it's just me and the garbage. But what are you going to do? Well, my dream is to win the lottery. So, yeah. There's your team up for the season, everybody. Piggy foreshadowing the events of SPD. I have no words. Well, I do have the words that they could do it primarily because the actor who plays him, Barney Duncan, is also Toby's actor. To be fair, his use here is kind of helpful in painting a picture for Genji of what his life would be like without friends, but it's a non-issue since apparently he can't survive more than two hours outside of the lamp and he knows that, so it's really just fan service. In non-crossover material, the baby dragon becomes a full-sized dragon. We also learned that what Phineas did that was so terrible? Yeah, not that terrible. It turns out that when Daggeron and Kalindor had their battle, Phineas found Udana's son Bowen and took him to the human world to keep him safe. Combine that with the knowledge revealed in the same episode that Nick is adopted, and all he has left of his birth parents is a red blanket that looks exactly like the one we saw on Bowen, and I think any of you can probably put two and two together. The story continues in the three-parter Dark Wish. While the Rangers, now more comfortable with their spellcasting abilities, use their sacred gifts to do their damn day jobs, Imperius summons the Barbarian Beasts, four powerful warriors that, by Korag's definition, have no honor. Look, Korag, you and the honor thing... See, Villamax could get away with the honor because he actually followed an honorable code and behaved in a knightly fashion despite working for the bad guys. And he knew when things went too far. 
You're just some asshole who keeps whining about how honorable you are without actually giving any real proof of that honor. Oh, you refuse to kill the rangers sometimes. That's not being honorable, that's being an idiot. Two of the beasts are easily destroyed by the rangers, who are growing more tired and wanting to look for magical shortcuts to end the battles over Dagron and Udana's objections. However, this was all part of Imperius's plan. He even sends the two remaining beasts against Korag, saying his plans don't involve the master that the villains have been serving, and know that it won't approve. Korag is easily defeated, partially because his magic is in Necrolize's hands thanks to a previous episode. Phineas comes across Korag and helps him get to safety. The rangers, exhausted from the previous battles, demand Daggeron use Genji to defeat the beasts and he finally acquiesces. However, the beasts capture Genji and apparently he has to grant their wish. I wish there were never Mystic Force Power Rangers! No! 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 Part 1 ends with the sky turning black, Daggeron disappearing, and smoke filling the command tree. In part two, the rangers see that the entire city has turned monochrome, and there's been some kind of cataclysm. They find Toby, who doesn't recognize Nick. He says that the darkness overtook the city four months previously. The rangers try to return to the command tree, but the portal is gone. Going to the forest itself, they find the entrance to the place has also been wrecked, the xenotome destroyed, and Udana half-crazed. The rangers ask her and Claire for an explanation, but all she says is that good magic no longer exists. We can probably presume that Claire never took up her mother's vestments either. Let's face it, Udana probably went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs a while ago, so she never told Claire of her heritage. Let's see. We've lost Genji. We're no longer Power Rangers. We no longer have any magic. In fact, there's no longer any good magic, and the world's ruled by the Dark Forces. So, what about all the other rangers in the world? I mean, sure, they probably got defeated too, but it's only the Mystic Force rangers who could have stopped this. Now, you could say that they wanted to keep things self-contained and not bring in the continuity of other series. I say then, why the hell did you bother with the cameo from Piggy only an episode ago? Consistency is all I ask for, my friends. But really, that's a minor nitpick. I actually really like the three-parter, and I'll get into why in a little bit. Korag appears to the rangers, and while Nick wants to attack, Korag says he's only interested in talking. They exchange information, and Korag agrees to help them because he doesn't like Imperius. Nick points out the stupidity of this. So, you want darkness to rule the world, but not if they don't do it nicely. <laughs> Without honor, victory is meaningless. I refer you to my earlier remarks concerning Villamax. He worked for Trakina out of a sense of fealty and chivalry, not because of abstract concepts about honor for its own sake. Korag says they need to go to the Tribunal of Magic to get the spell reversed, but they reside inside another dimension. Thanks to this Age of Power Rangers apocalypse, the Dragon Egg was found by Korag instead of them, and thus he raised it, and it can act as a vehicle to bring the rangers to the Tribunal. The rangers arrive in a desert as the dragon departs. In order to reach the tribunal, the rangers have to fight against every warrior who has ever failed to reach the tribunal. It's a real highlight since it's all unmorphed fights. No explosions or fancy special effects, except wireworks maybe. Just the rangers having to use martial arts in slow motion to fight off a bunch of sword-wielding zombies. After the fight, they're given a key to a door from a David Lynch movie. The second test is between two of the said doorways. One leads them supposedly back home, instant success, but the other is to the tribunal itself. Nick and Vita point out that if they just take the door back to their own world and instant success, it's just the easy way out, which they've been doing so far. The five arrive at the tribunal, who are all kind of dicks. This is Enough. Go home. There is nothing we can do for you. Wait, wait, wait a second. We were told that you could reverse a genie's wish. We can. But we won't. Go! The Tribunal doesn't really give a crap if magic is good or evil, just that magic exists. The Rangers argue against them, and the Tribunal is quick to point out that the whole thing is really their own damn fault. However, they make their case, and the Tribunal confers on a decision. We admire the ability it took to get here. We applaud the case you presented us. By the powers entrusted in us, we do not grant your request. 
Go home. However, it turns out to be another test by the Tribunal, to see if they would give up after being sent back. As Part 3 begins and the Rangers see people getting oppressed, they can't stand idly by and fight the Hideaks, despite their lack of powers. The Tribunal votes to reverse the genie's wish and everything is restored to normal. Genji tricks Lili into getting him out of his lamp and he escapes. As the Rangers fight the remaining two beasts, the Tribunal watches and the Rangers admit how they screwed up before with their laziness. As such, the Tribunal grants them a gift. The Mystic Legend Armor, spiffy new threads that serve as an upgraded form for the team. They even get Sailor Moon staffs that have rotary phone dials on them. It is just as the ancient legends foretold. They even get new zords that are introduced in the last five minutes that form the Manticore Megazord. Dark Wish is a great story. The moral lesson feels natural for the Rangers' character development at this point in the series. The dark world ruled by evil is only seen briefly, but to see everything so screwed up is a treat and creates real tension. The unmorphed fight is fantastic and the new legend mode looks badass. However, like with the Samurai's journey back in Ninja Storm, its main problem is that there's two episodes of story that they finish up with at the beginning of Part 3, leaving the rest of the episode to feel rather hollow. It's mostly action, and while the action is nice, especially with the new modes, it feels weaker than the previous two parts. I think I would have preferred them sticking around in the darker world a bit longer instead of having everything fixed so soon. Korag, in his first real act of honor, defends the Rangers from Imperius during a fight that would have destroyed their Zords. Imperius presents evidence to the Master that it's a routine problem for him to never finish a fight simply because the Rangers are defenseless or some other bullcrap even though they're clearly still willing and able to fight him. It's actually a pretty good use of a clip show. The clips are really quick and serve the purpose of pointing out what a colossal failure Korag is as a minion of evil. Mind you, considering this was right after the Dark Wish three-parter, we really didn't need clips from it. Both Imperius and Korag are allowed to stick around in the end, rendering most of the episode pretty pointless, though. However, this does lead us into the two-parter Heir Apparent, where the Rangers are filled in on Udana's backstory concerning her missing husband Leonbo and son Bowen. They explain about the final battle with the Dark Forces and how Kalandor had betrayed them while Leonbo had gone to fight the Master on his own. Of course, when they mention that the guy always fought with honor, combined with Korag having flashbacks of the baby Bowen, once again, you can put two and two together. Yeah, Leon Bo stayed on the other side of the gates when they were sealed to fight alone and was transformed by the Master into Korag. Kind of a dumbass move by Leon Bo, but then again, this is the same guy who thinks that a self-professed evil empire would cherish a virtue like honor. Korag is dispatched to steal the Rangers' legend powers while Imperius takes on Daggeron, managing to steal his Megazord's energy and using it to create a Chimera monster from all of Lian Bo's defeated enemies. He even seemingly destroys Daggeron and Genji. The Rangers are sent into the Underworld, directly into the main chamber of evil in fact, which is something we haven't really seen for a while outside of a season finale. Here they discover Lili's parentage and allegiance. With the Rangers in the worst danger of their lives, Udana opens a book full of dark spells to try to aid them, despite the fact that it could lead to her losing her magic. The Rangers' energy is drained into the Master, but Udana arrives to rescue them. Unfortunately, the Master attacks her instead. Korag regains his memories and breaks off the Master's attack, reverting to Leonbo. Leonbo teleports the Rangers out of the Underworld and explains what happened to him. However, Udana is weakened by the dark spells and is sent back to the command tree while the Rangers take on the Chimera monster. The Master re-establishes the spell on Leonbo and he reverts to Korag. Also, Daggeron just shows up with a unicorn that can travel to other dimensions and is also kind of a new zord. Because that's just how Power Rangers tends to work. Except in this case, the unicorn is never seen again. Now, why was I harping on the honor thing considering Korag turned out to be good? Well, partially because of Snark, and partially because it doesn't really make him a complex villain or character this way. He's just another generic, boring, good guy who was corrupted to be evil, except for this one part of him that logically the forces of evil would have stripped him of because of the fact that it's not for the honor crap he would have easily defeated the Rangers half a dozen times! And hell, we've seen this kind of story done before in previous seasons, and... 
well done better in those cases. Astronema, Merrick, hell, the Titanium Ranger story of a good guy corrupted by evil was better handled, and that was all of like two or three episodes. Daggeron manages to destroy Imperius, and all of his remaining energy gets sent into the Master as he begins to rise. Udana, discovering Nick's blanket, figures out that he's her long-lost son. Udana reveals this to Nick and Korag, allowing him to revert back to Leonbo. The Master rises through the ground, and Leonbo uses magic to hold the Rangers back while he engages the Master on his own, instead getting dragged down. And here's another big problem with this series, tied in with my earlier complaint about having far too many extraneous characters. The show really isn't about the Rangers. It's about all these people who were engaged in this mystical battle beforehand and their attempts to come back together to fight again. It's about Udana and her search for all of her lost friends or how they were betrayed or how they were turned to evil. And frankly, a lot of it is really predictable, cliched, and boring. They're either good-hearted, selfless, virtuous individuals, or treacherous, evil, deceitful creatures. There are no shades of gray, no regrets or consequences. It's just really dull. In fact, the series is at its best when it actually is focusing on the other Rangers, besides Nick, who has his own issues, as we'll get to, or Claire, since they're imperfect and have actual personalities behind them. Leonbo uses his magic to once more seal the Master in the depths and collapse the Underworld. Udana holds out hope that Leonbo will return and decides to leave on a quest to find him on her own. Meanwhile, in the ruins of the Underworld, Lili decides to leave her mother, really kind of just bored with the evil lifestyle, while Necroli finds a handily labeled Book of Prophecy and stumbles into a deeper chamber in the Underworld, discovering the Ten Terrors, ten gigantic creatures who are apparently close in power level to the Master, but still served him. Necroli informs them of recent events and tells them that the Light has been found, referring to Nick as Satellite. The Rangers, of course, confront them when they make a hell of an entrance, and then just drop back down into the Underworld again. Well, uh, that was something.